So today we're going to go slow because, or I'm going to try to go slow because this stuff is really cool. We're going to try to go slow because I don't want anyone to miss the punchline. <laughs> and and it, it's actually surprisingly, um, it, it's surprisingly interesting. The takeaways are, are fairly straightforward because a lot of this is a blast from the past. This is, this is going back to classical old school concepts. So we'll talk about quantum behavior, state, a knowable state, quantization, how do we measure? And we observe by measuring, especially in the quantum universe. Classical versus quantum physics, a little bit on physics, not a lot, light and fluffy. And then qubits, valid states. And time, because that's a big thing, it's gonna be ultimately the issue that we're gonna have to figure out on how we sequence mutable states, sequence computation. The quantum data structure and some observations. So that's, that's kind of what we're going through today. But surprisingly, and actually this surprised me too, uh, go ahead and interrupt and ask questions, but the, a lot of this is back to basics. A lot of this is a reference back to the early stages of, of engineering, computing, and you know, software engineering even. Quantum is this word thrown a lot, around a lot, so we're going to dispel some myths, but we're going to kind of focus on what's going on with the quantum hardware and kind of what's the response with software, what are we going to have to do. So ultimately, this ends up being very consistent with today's best practice, today's current practice. There's not actually a lot of new stuff when you talk about a quantum data structure. When you get new quantum hardware, a lot of things change. But if you do it on a classical computer, everything you do is, is actually very similar to what you're doing now. So quantum behavior. So this is C++. This is an example of, OK, well, what's the output? So just kind of highlighting some stuff. Is x plus 1 greater than x? Well, Yes, of course, x plus 1 is greater than x. That's what this is saying. Well, x plus 1 is greater than x unless you add 1 to int max. Int max, now it's undefined. So in that case, the compiler can optimize, saying, well, well, I can always assume it's well-defined. So the compiler may choose to optimize this differently. In this particular case, x plus 1 being greater than x, the compiler has two different opinions on that. When we run it, sometimes it's 0, sometimes it's 1, depending on context. But here's an example of in the exact same program, x plus 1 being greater than x, it's true, it's false, in the same program run from the same process image. Because we're using this very interesting thing of undefined behavior, for which C++ is classically famous. And then this example, of course, comes from John McGarry, he's a university professor at University of Utah, and he has a really good talk on undefined behavior, and this is an example. But this talks about superposition. Superposition is the simultaneous holding of all valid states. So this is just a classical program, easy to repeat, but we have multiple opinions on the exact same computation. A knowable state. So when we talk about state, what is state? Well, state's going to be an, an, it's going to be an instance of a type with a given value. That, that, that kind of smells like an object because that's what it is. So bool, bool b, b, it's true or false. It's small, there's not a lot of state there, it's true or false. Well, it can be a little bit bigger. So if you had a, a child process that you launched, well, there's, there's a lot of state associated with that. You might think about the runtime stack and, well, there's an environment in there and it's creating its own objects. And this is sort of this meta information of maybe it's trying to grab context from other system resources. There's actually a tremendous amount of state inside a launched process, a forked process. So when you, when you kind of bundle all that stuff up, that, that's, that's an enormous amount of state of which we usually try to bound what we think about pipes, streams, standard in, standard out, standard error. That's how we'll interact with processes. It's kind of a bounded view of state, but there's a lot more state there. And then, well, you can have a lot, a lot of state. So a node cluster, that's, that's many machines or many pieces of hardware. You could have a data center with a bunch of stuff in it. You have the whole internet that's kind of big. And you know, this is, this is kind of the thing they talk about when they say quantum computing. You can have everything. You can have a whole universe and shrink it down into one teeny little thing. And this is all some kind of manipulation of state. So yeah, as long as you can feasibly figure out what your state is and interact with it in a sensible manner, yeah, whatever's feasible, that's your state. OK, categories of state. Well, there's, there's really kind of three kinds. I can access it. I can access it sometimes, not always. I might have to plan that. It might be destructive. There might be side effects. I can access it never. 
So a lot of times there's no interface to the state. The state's there, we rely upon it. The state is a necessary aspect of the computation being performed or the context being provided. But the state we can't get to because there's no interface that's well-defined. And for C++ in particular, well-defined access is a necessity. If it's not well-defined, you can't have it. You can access it, but it's garbage. It doesn't mean anything. So states defined ultimately the access by the observer. One observer can view the state, maybe directly manipulate it. Another observer, maybe there are windows where this other observer can access it. And maybe another observer yet can never access that state. So states always accessed based on the context of the observer. Directly accessible, a global, in a single-threaded program. Just hit it, there it is, there you go. So this is a standard C or C++ non-racy access to a stateful value. And it's cheap, it's easy, anybody can have it. Indirectly accessible. Well, sometimes, especially since C++ has this real strong object model, Sometimes the state exists, but it's not initialized yet. Or the state might be halfway through a mutation because there's contention for multiple threads on it. So you can't just grab it whenever you want. You have to kind of plan that access. And then in a lot of cases, especially in our more complicated systems, you know, access is going to be destructive. I can access the state, but there will be a destruction, there'll be a side effect, there'll be an irreversible circumstance or thing that occurs. And so therefore, you know, I'm, I'm going to hold off on the axis until it's important, and then the side effect will occur. And this is what we're going to have to deal with with quantum systems, classical machines, quantum data structures, or new quantum hardware. Typically, access is destructive. You can access it, but it'll be destructive. So you're going to want to plan that out. And then, of course, that last category is you can't have it. The state's there, but there's no interface to it, so you can't have it or the state's there, but there's no well-defined interface to it. So anything you might access in an undefined way, in the C++ language, for example, by definition, that's unobservable. It's undefined. You can access it, but it's garbage. It doesn't mean anything. And, and actually, bad things can happen if you try to access something that is not well-defined or through a pattern that's not well-defined. And the tools that we use, you know, they're different in each language, but in C++, there's a very strong object model. There's also a very strong memory model, C++11 and later. And these happen to be useful mechanisms to talk about quantum data structures and how we're going to start looking at future access to state, which the common pattern will be. It's destructive. So there is this funny little idea. And, and, and most all this stuff that we're going to talk about today is obvious. It is obvious. There's nothing new here, except it kind of smells new. A lot of times, Accessing the state, meaning it's inspectable or observable, is totally independent of uh, whether, well, say again, knowing or not the state versus using or not the state are orthogonal. These are orthogonal thoughts. So it's kind of weird, but a lot of times the common pattern, especially in the quantum data structure, will be you're going to use the state, you're productively employing that state, but you cannot observe it, you cannot look at it, you cannot access it, that's going to be destructive. So debugging gets weird, conditional processing, runtime classification of your data values, you cannot have that. That's gone because you're using the state, you created it, it's yours, you cannot look at it. So you're going to use it, you will not know what it is, you won't runtime classify. So this is going to be the common thing. These are orthogonal thoughts, and this is probably the biggest mental shift. You can use it, you can't look at it. Quantization, counts of whole quantum. There is an argument to be made that there is a unified theory for all things software, and it would be this. Software is the art of defining rules for quantization because you define what those rules are, you define what the data types are. You decide how you want to employ state, source, and sync within your systems. And all the measures, all the sensitivity, that's up to you. You're the software engineer, and we have infinite flexibility. So actually, we map to this quantum universe really well. The poor hardware guys, they have a lot of work to do. But the software people, this is what we've been doing all along. This would just be recasting all of the software industry. How do you measure stuff? The quantum. There's the plural, which is quantum, but quantum. 
The quantum is the discrete resolution value within a data structure, within you know, something, something you measure, that enables type invariance. So a bool, the quantum's gonna be you know, some Boolean value, true, false, but we have these higher order data types. Let's look at the basic ones real quick. But uh, the, the takeaway really is this is not new, we do this now. We, we, we select what type we wanna use, we select what the rules are, we compose those into higher order types, we sometimes apply new context, new rules for interpretation, which is gonna be the type composition and type creation. And that's all systems. They're ultimately all sitting on top of primitive values that run through the hardware. So int i, what would the quantum for i be if it's the discrete resolution value? Any, any thoughts? You know, nobody wants to guess, but it's a whole integer, right? It's one, it's a whole count. And you know, we're so familiar with this, that's not new, of course, duh, it's, you don't get a fraction of an integer, it's a whole number. Well, how about float f? What's the quantum? Yeah, I'm hearing it kind of in the back. It's, it's going to be the machine epsilon. You know, there is a discrete resolution that exists. There is always a resolution that exists. And in this case, the machine epsilon, this can be a little bit tricky because that epsilon value floats around. We'll talk about that in a second. Day of week. Class day of week, Monday through, through Sunday or Sunday through Saturday or however you want to do it. We have enumerated values. What's the quantum of that data structure? Yeah, it's, it's the day. The, that it's gonna have one of those values, one of the enumerated values in there. And all the higher order types, they all drop out to having a quantum. There is a representable state, we'll snapshot into the bit pattern. So if you're gonna quantize, you're gonna constrain to a discrete set. When you're gonna measure, you're also gonna constrain to a discrete set, you're gonna use a measurement. But to count whole units of quantum, that's, that's the basis of quantum mechanics, quantum physics, quantum data structures, quantum everything. You're putting everything into a discrete set. So quantization is gonna to restrict to a discrete set. And when we define types, when we compute state, we are always coming up with discrete values. That's it, that's all we're doing. This is not new, this is what we do now. Defining a quantum. So let's say, hey, there's this um, data structure I need and it needs to represent the day of the month. And well, we, we all have calendars, Gregorian. And you know, day of the month, we, we kind of know what the rules are. The rules are kind of this one to 31. That's, that's kind of the range we need. So what, what, what would we want to select as a data type maybe for this? If, yeah, yeah, probably an int, a little int. It's got to handle basically one to 31. And then as we go a little further, Maybe we want a trap value. Maybe, maybe zero is not set. Maybe, maybe we want that. You don't have to have that, but sometimes that's useful. But 32 is right out. We don't need that. Negative one, that, that's right out. We don't need that either. So we start selecting data types based on our understanding of the quantum and the range. And now for integers, that's generally well understood. Floats, we get into trouble. But this thing on the right is actually how we have to remap our understanding. The range is not continuous. The range is composed of discrete values. So you can have the value one, you can have the value 31, you cannot have the value 0.5, you cannot have the value 20.2. There are discrete values, we are constraining this data object to those values. That's the quantum jump. So the quantum jump is the atomic state, the atomic value that would be represented if I were to have looked at this data structure. It's gonna have one of the discrete values. It won't have half of a number. It's an integer, it's an integral value. It's a whole number, so it won't be a fraction. So it's not chaos, we've constrained to reality, which is a finite set within a legal range. So this quantum jump thing, it is the instantaneous transition to a new quantum value without the intermediate transition through other values. That's the quantum jump. We also call it the quantum leap, but quantum data structures rely upon this. Quantum physics relies upon this. So you can have one of the discrete values. You cannot have these magical impossible values that land between the discrete values. That cannot happen. That never happens. So if you get that down, you get quantum physics down. So our data structures are always going to transition through quantum jumps, always landing on discrete values. That's it, full stop. 
Commonly used, well, integers are cool because we've normalized the quantum. So when you select a data type, long int, short, signed, unsigned, you're essentially establishing ranges of values that are legal. We might put additional constraints on that. Day of month only has one to 31, maybe with a trap value of zero. And these ranges we select, we further restrict based on the type information. And now we have a new object, a new data type. But they're still sitting on discrete values transitioning through quantum jumps. So this is what we have now. It's just that you know, sometimes in, an, in a racy manner, we might access a corrupted undefined value. But if you're always well-defined, you're good. So we've normalized the quantum for integers. That's why integers are so easy to work with. We've normalized them. And not only have we normalized them among software languages and people, we've normalized from software to hardware. It's normalized, whole numbers, whole integers. Now, normalizing floating point is a little bit harder. So what do we do? Well, continuous range. We have a floating point value because you know, whole numbers are, it's too coarse. I need more. Okay, well, we have this floating point resolution thing, and th there's still going to be a range. There's a, there's a minimum and a max that you can have, and what's the quantum? What is the discrete resolution value? We kind of showed it before, but it's sort of a trick question, and the reason it's trick is because it depends. In C++, other languages can pick their own thing, but this is a hardware problem because it changes from machine epsilon depending on the hardware. Epsilon, for float, for example, in this case for C++, is defined as the difference between 1.0 and the next representative value, the difference, that smallest unit, that maximally resolvable resolution unit, assuming you're moving from 1.0 to something bigger than 1.0. So that's your resolution. That's your quantum. Now, this is a bit of a sticky problem. Comparing floats is hard, very hard, because the quantum will change. Is your range 0 to 1, negative 1 to positive 1, negative 2 million to positive 2 million, negative infinity to positive infinity? When you start fiddling with your range, the quantum is changing. And that's kind of like type punning, and that's why we have resolution issues in comparing floats. This is very hard to do because we have not normalized the quantum. That's why floats are hard. But the resolution always exists. And in this case, we have a way to access the hardware limits. OK, so moving on. A continuous range does not exist. Let's pretend for a moment that's true. In software, that's always true. Classical machines, that's always true. And the reason it's always true is because it's represented by a bit pattern. And that bit pattern is limited in what it can represent. There is always a resolution present. And you can't go beyond that resolution. It's just what it is. But because each value is uniquely resolvable, and in this case, we have you know, this, this ordering of data, they're uniquely comparable, too. You just have to watch what you think of the quantum, that resolution value. So the floating point range is actually the stair step thing. It is not a continuous range. It's just a more granular version of this stair steppy thing. And you know, everybody jump in and pipe in anytime you want. But we'll move on. Going to a bigger float does not take away the stair step. It's still there. You are limited in the resolution that is represented. You have, you have a smaller resolution. You have more bits. You can better approximate a value. But you, what you're actually seeing is a range of discrete values, not continuous values. They are discrete values. And because of the quantum disagreement, that, that discrete value is actually not linearly uh, distributed over that range. It's just kind of a, a spread, depending on how you want to represent floats on your hardware. So the takeaway, a continuous range does not exist. It does not. You have discrete bit patterns. You are limited by resolution. A resolution limit always exists. You cannot get around that. All ranges are composed of discrete values. There may be a lot of them if you have more bits. But they're just ranges of discrete values. Data objects are always represented by bits on a classical machine. And actually, on quantum hardware, that's going to be true. It's just they're going to be superposition sitting on this quantum interference thing. Data objects are always quantized, but they are physically represented. They ultimately have a resolution limit. An illusion of non-discrete is possible. Whenever you start comparing things that disagree on quantum, 
or when you start applying this higher versus lower resolution of stuff, whenever your clocks are not in sync, you can get the illusion of continuous. But in reality, everything is actually discrete. The natural world is quantum. So we, we, we've heard this, it's a thing, and you know, sometimes they talk about it in school, but the analog versus digital, we're aware of this. And there's a lot of this when we cut over from vinyl to digital music, and now vinyl's coming back. But analog was that continuous range. Digital was that discrete set. And there's a mapping, and there's a lossy transform, and there's all kinds of funny math we do to try and manage this. But a resolution limit always exists. So historically, we would use lots of technology like chemical development of film, which is, it, it kind of looks like an analog process. It's sitting on the real world. It's at a resolution we didn't understand. Well, we kind of understand. I mean, we can measure the resolution of a film. And now that we've moved to digital cameras, well, we can measure the resolution of that too. And so there is a resolution limit, and we can measure that, and we can compare those. So the takeaways here being, there is always a resolution limit, and it's going to be measurable. We just might be limited in our ability to detect. And as hardware has gotten better, we detect more phenomenon, and that's quantum computing. We're just detecting phenomenon. It's been there all along, but now we can see it better. This is the difference between classical and quantum physics. Classical assumed ranges, values in the range were continuous. That was an assumption, of course, that would be true. You mean go cold to hot, or dark to bright, or you know, heavy to light. The, it's, the resolution is so fine, it sure appears continuous. Everybody assumed that to be true. It's not true. We know that's not true. It's mathematically inconsistent with what we see and prove and observe in reality, in reality everything is discrete and that makes sense because everything in reality is energy interactions with the atomic structure and we know that exists. So we'll talk about that in a second. But classical assumed continuous, quantum is discrete, that looks a lot like our resolution of integers and floats because it is. So we map straight over to this stuff. So there's some names coming up here and you know some big names but um, you know, there are a lot of words, and you guys can, the slides are free, take them home, but the, this is just to give you a taste of what's going on. But the hero of the show is actually Max Carl Ernst Ludwig Planck. So there he is, running around, doing his little thing in 1900. This is 120 years ago. This is light bulb time. Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla are running around doing their thing. And he's been charged with, he's an academic, he's teaching stuff, but he's been charged with work on light bulbs, build a better light bulb. And well, if the, a perfect light bulb is a perfect emitter of, of photons. So to understand that better, well, we need to mathematically describe a black body that would be a perfect absorber of photons. That would be cool. So black body, math, and stuff. He was working on that. Years, no progress, bad things happen. Very despondent, sad guy. Until one day he says, all right, well, um, I'm just going to throw in a constant, make the formula work. We'll publish it now and fix it later. And, you know, he didn't believe it. it, it this is just too crazy. But he published, and it turns out, oh my gosh, this guy's onto something. So a fraction of a quantum cannot exist because of that constant he threw in there called the Planck's constant, and you know, it's H. So based on that, we are going to now have a whole unit, a whole quantum that we're gonna use to start playing with light, and now the math works for light bulbs. Turns out light bulbs work. There's one right over there. So, this quantized nature of electromagnetic radiation, this was a huge thing. Nobody was thinking about this before. So hero to him. And um, he went through a lot to get that. This is really before and after Planck. This is this world not being continuous. The world is composed of discrete values. That's the basis. So we used to assume it was continuous. We know that's not true now. We know everything's actually um, made up of ranges of discrete values. And modern physics got reset before and after this time. This is 120 years ago. He did the work in 1900, Nobel Prize in 1905, or whenever it was. When was that? Uh, go back up. There he is, 1918. So he had to wait 20 years. Poor guy. Okay, so post-Newtonian physics is, is kind of this world of quantum physics that we've been playing on for the last 120 years. Photoelectric effect, Nobel Prize. Here's, you know, somebody. And... 
It is not continuous when you have photons hitting a metal plate. You are either dislodging an electron or you are not dislodging an electron. And there is a work function. The work function is the minimum threshold energy required. So in comes a photon and it dislodges an electron. Or in comes a photon and it did not dislodge an electron. Well, if it did not dislodge an electron, why not? Well, it didn't exceed the work function. There's a threshold that it must hit to actually dislodge that electron. And that work function, the double E's would start to get really excited because what do I have to buy? What, what kind of serviceable parts do I have to maintain? What kind of peak sample hold circuit do I need to employ to start getting some beautiful clean signal out from this crazy nutty noise in? And the answer is nothing because this is a quantum universe and everything is sitting on that work function. So quantum computing, there are a lot of ways to do it, is ultimately based on that work function generating a clean out signal from a set of inputs. That's it. So my glass of water is a CPU. That chair is a CPU. You are especially interesting CPU. There are lots of CPUs. So this is photoelectric effect. There's him. Bremsterlung, we'll throw that in there because he's the first Nobel Prize recipient, Wilhelm Conrad Röntgen, and uh, that's the opposite of the photoelectric effect. So when you bash two particles into each other, they produce x-rays. Who knew? So you either get the particle to emit an, an x-ray or, or a photon from a particle collision or not. It's, it's discrete. You either got it or did not. The work function is in play. Atomic model, Bohr, so Niels Bohr, Orbitals exist, the electrons snap up and down, and you want it to snap out, you give him, an, give him a photon and he snaps up. You have him snap down, he emits a photon. It's discrete. You either got the photon or not. So electrons exist in discrete orbitals, and we snap electrons across orbitals interacting with the photons. So that's at HF. HF is the photon. Electron shell, so it turns out you can do math on this. So Carl Mane Sigmund figured out that you know, there are all these little shells for all the little atoms, and you could do all kinds of complicated math, and everything matches to patterns, but electrons drop to a lower, lower orbital or do not. They snap to a higher orbital or they do not. So everything is sitting on discrete interactions. Compton scattering, so not continuous. Light is demonstrated to behave as a particle. Now, this was new because now we all talk about the wave-particle duality. But back then, well, we all know light's a wave. Well, well, it is a wave. Well, now we know light's a particle. Well, it is a particle. Well, no, it can't be both. Well, actually, it can be both, but not at the same time. Depends on how you're looking at it or what leg you're standing on. So this was very big at the time saying that light is both, it is, not that it acts like, it is. It is both a particle and a wave simultaneously, but not at the same time. So Louis de Broglie, a particle of arbitrary mass is discreetly guided by a wave function. And this is that interesting thing where if light is both a particle and a wave, it turns out everything is both a particle and a wave. And that was ultimately what came along here. And mass is not constant. True mass is not constant. All matter exists, um, exhibits wave-like behavior. So that's interesting. Nobel Prize for him. <sighs> Werner Carl Heisenberg. Quantum jumps do occur or not, but this is the introduction of matrix math. Matrix math used to be the domain of math people doing math things. A lot of math people walking around in the halls here. Matrix math was introduced to physics here. And this is the idea of wave function collapse, waveform collapse. We're going to describe mathematically what's going on. We will solve the equation, get a value. And that collapse is system state. We discarded the operands. We have the result. We discarded the operands. This is a destructive read. You do an observation. You do a measurement. You you get the value, you discarded the operands. Destructive read. So you get your quantum jumps, have fun. Erwin er er Rudolf Josef Alexander Schrodinger. So not continuous. Measurements are discrete, but they're correlated with probabilities. So classical, no probabilities. You better get the same number twice. Quantum, eh, 
yeah, it's a generalization of probability. You're going to get probabilistic interactions, and you know, especially if you don't insulate your system. So we move to complex numbers. Complex numbers are weird. They have you know i that square root of negative one in there. We'll talk about that in a second. But this probabilistic unknown is a fundamental attribute of this quantum world in which we live. So you know, he's the father of quantum mechanics. We regret it later. Paul Adrian Maurice Dirac, so, so it has been said that Einstein has been called the greatest gift to cartoonists that, you know, cartoonists ever had, because, you know, the hair and, you know, the personality, and he's larger than life, and that's why Einstein is such a part of our social fabric, you know, fast forward 100 years later, but if Einstein wasn't there, it would be this guy. Um, Antiparticles exist, they mirror non-antiparticles, so if there's an electron, then there's an anti-electron, and it's perfect mutual annihilation when they collide. And so, you know, you have CERN, you can go build any matter stuff. So he also came up with electron spin, and this is all coming out of, we have matrix math, we have complex numbers, we solve, get this electron spin, lots of interesting things happen because there's a whole universe of antimatter out there. So now we have quantum field theory. So that's enough physics, but this is basically all that's going on. You have a photon, or you do not. You have electron spin of some value, or some multiple of that value, because it's been quantized. Everything is quantized. So you can't subdivide a photon. You can only get another photon from a photon, or, or no photon at all. So energy is discrete. Energy interactions are discrete. Everything is discrete. Everything in the observable universe is discrete. It's not analog. It's just that your resolution in your clock has to be high enough to pick it up, which with today's manufacturing science, it is. So HF, that's a photon. That's our epsilon for light. Okay, so why is it indivisible? Well, here's why. Why is it indivisible? Well, the phenomenon makes sense. You know, light comes in, it hits electrons. You know, 120 years later, we kind of know electron orbitals and particle wave duality. You know, we kind of get all that stuff. You know, we talk about it only sometimes, but these are standing waves. So the whole point of a standing wave is you have it or you don't have it. So when you're talking about the node and anti-node that comprises standing wave, and there are a lot of examples of standing waves, particles ultimately are standing waves. And that's why with the node and anti-node, particle standing wave with itself, entanglement is multiple particles participating in a standing wave. You know, De Broglie doing his thing, saying all matter exists in both particle and wave characteristics. That all matter does this, not just the energy stuff. It's because everything's sitting on standing waves. And, and you know, we know this table is not solid. It's not solid. It's made up of atoms. We know atoms are pretty much empty space. They're pretty much all empty space. Solid things don't exist. We've never found one. What we have found are a lot of these standing waves. So electrons, subatomic, whatevers, they're all little standing waves. Doing around playing with their standing wave selves. So quantum is the wavelength. So here would be a mathematical approximation there on the left. That would be a mathematical uh, description of a particle that's a standing wave with itself. Some really good work being done by the Russians. Uh, th that, that little video there, you know, I recommend you go check it out. It's kind of cool. It, it doesn't look right. That's a hunk of metal. That's a, that's a T. You know, he spins the T. It's a piece, there are no moving parts there. And it spins, it gets unstable, and it flips. Spins, gets unstable, and it flips. And this is an utterly unbelievable video on the space station because that's drawing a particle. That's what particles are. That's how they work, sitting on the intermediate axis theorem for physics. So that's a particle, everything's standing waves. What's quantized? Everything's quantized. Well, our software is, that's true. But the real world is too. So energy, mass, electron spin, all other units, everything we got going on, everything is quantized. The only issue has been, what's your clock and what's your resolution? As long as you're good enough there, everything's quantized. So continuous doesn't exist, has never existed. Everything has been that stair-step thing, transitioning through quantum dumps, jumps. So the natural world's high resolution, software, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't match math, it doesn't match observed reality, the old way, the Newtonian way, the assumption of continuous way, that's not true. Everything is energy interactions with the atomic structure. Reality is pixelated through energy interactions with the atomic structure. That's it. That's, that's all quantum computers are doing. There's so many ways to build quantum computers. We're building and discovering new ways all the time because we're fiddling around with these quantized values where you don't even have to 
you know, it's there. It's just your resolution, your ability to measure is limited. So everything's waveforms, cold to hot, dim to bright, light to heavy, uh, mass and energy are perfectly convertible. We're kind of aware of all this stuff. We sometimes talk about it, but you know, most of the time we dismiss it. But really life is just discreetly quantized, that's all. Everything works on quantum mechanics. You know, that just says everything. <sighs> Valid states, back to work. In quantum versus classical systems, what is the radix? So this ends up being actually a very interesting and important question. So the radix is, of course, the number of unique states. So you can have, you know, base 2, base 3, base 10, base 60, you know, pick a base, go nuts. Well, you know, most hardware, most software, most programming languages, because most programming languages are built to talk to, you know, instruction set architectures provided by the hardware, they're going to be base 2, because we're using base 2, and there's a whole reason they're base 2, largely it's inertia and history, but classical and quantum systems happen to be base 2. I'm on record as saying I think base 2 is really a bad thing. I, don't, I wouldn't pick base 2, I'd pick base 3, or really anything. Pick anything that's not base 2, and, and I'd be happy. So, base 2 is a specialized subset of multivalued logic, and that's under the assertion, and we're not going to go into it today, but it's under the assertion that the smallest thing in the universe that exists is a bit, a true or false value, that's the smallest thing that exists, applied with the attribute of unknown. Once you do that, you have three states. That's minimally required to express algorithms properly. But we're radix too. So the qubit. Qubit, we talk about the qubit, talk about the bit. The classical bit is radix too. Most of the quantum computers are sitting on qubits. Radix too. So what are the possible values for radix too? We're software people. We could probably work it out. Any thoughts? Zero and one. That's it. That's all you get. And it turns out, you know, you can stack them and get bigger things like floating point or integer or, you know, word processing documents. But the value at any given time, that's what's interesting. In a classical discrete system, it's going to be zero or one. It can't really be both unless you've got a lot of noise and everything's going badly. Quantum introduces this idea of quantum interference, which is based on the idea of superposition state, where the qubit is going to be a complex linear combination of a zero state and a one state. And that's going to give us this superpositioned idea. And that's going to be the characteristic difference between the classical and the quantum systems. So superposition is simultaneously holding all valid states. It's not, it's not technically not zero and one, that's the next slide. Here's the disclaimer. It's not technically zero and one. It's a complex linear combination of a zero value and a one value. So the qubit, it is an ontological category. It's a way of classifying things. There's no corollary to classical systems, no corollary. It's a way of combining things. And that way of combining things is based on the zero state and one state with stuff applied onto it so that if I were to observe it, I will ultimately get one of those two discrete values because it's radix two. Quantum mechanics being a generalization of probability, we're, we're using complex numbers, which you know, we'll talk about in a second, but complex numbers have amplitudes, positive or negative, and they deal with this negative square root of negative one thing. So, you know, there's, there's kind of a running joke in the C++ community, and, and a lot of you are probably aware that if you don't know what a monad is, all you have to do is recite out loud in mixed company, a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors, and then everyone will know that you, in fact, do know what a monad is. And the physics guys, well, they have a similar thing. Well, what's a qubit? And, oh, well, a qubit is just a unit vector in two-dimensional Hilbert space. So if someone questions whether or not you understand what a qubit is, you just say that, and then everyone will just know. Ah, ah, you, you do, in fact, know what a qubit is. So a qubit, it's kind of like a bool, a bit, a radix 2, that has this complex number applied to it. So it's kind of like that decal type keyword in C++ applied to that expression. Hey, if I were to take the type of that expression, what, what would that give me? Whatever that is, whatever weird thing that is, that's a qubit. Although, or you could just say a qubit is just a unit vector in two-dimensional Hilbert space, and then everyone would know. This is kind of a code up of a qubit. We have a complex number. A plus B, those are real, times the square root of negative one, that's I. That's a complex number, it's an imaginary number. It's imaginary because 
no real number, no self-respecting real number, would satisfy that equation. So now we have this bool, we have this complex number, which is sort of this expression here of an imaginary number. And when I do a dot get or a dot value in this case, we're going to do a destructive mutation. We're going to multiply the complex number by the bool that we had. We're going to cast that to a true or false. We will get a true or a false from something. And then we're going to mutate ourselves by dropping, by decohering our entangled state, and then we'll yield our value. So this is a mutating destructive read. That is class qubit. And, and it's actually incomplete because, you know, it's an ontological category that has no correlation to classical stuff. To do this right, not only do I have to mutate myself when I drop my coherence with all those things to which I was entangled, I have to go mutate them. So I should go run through everything to which I am coupled, mutate them to a collapsed value, decohere them, everybody's dropped. That's ultimately what we would need to do. And as you might guess, this is a significantly higher computational density over classical programs. And the reason for that is because we have a lot going on. We have high coupling, destructive read, and, and you better plan out when you do that destructive read because if you're wanting to change other things elsewhere, you better do it before the read because at that point, all bets are off. So ultimately, though, we have a pattern for this. This is a mutating lazy compute. You know, th th there are a lot of corollaries in other languages for this. What is that quantum object doing? Oh, it's doing a mutating lazy compute. There's a pattern. This is nothing new. We do this. We tend to do it in areas with high complexity where high complexity is warranted in the design. So we have these words and, you know, we, we always, you know, now there's a whole vernacular in software about, you know, we have cool words, but the physics guys, they have the coolest words. So they use words like eigenstate and eigenvalue. And, you know, our words are static and auto and, you know, bool. And so terminology actually is surprisingly important in the land of quantum physics because now are, are you talking about this object that I've collapsed the value on? That's the eigenstate, the value, the pinned value. Or did I not look at it yet? I'm using it, I'm maybe coupling it with other stuff, and it's in a superposition state. I haven't collapsed it yet. Well, that's the eigenvalue. So this eigenstate eigenvalue, that's this. Eigenstate is the pinned value. You looked at it, you destructed it, you own it. You broke it, you bought it. Eigenvalue is still superpositioned. It's there, we can use it, but we haven't resolved what that value is. Its value is uncertain. So eigenstates are certain, eigenvalues are uncertain. When we observe them, they will become certain. So eigenvalues always collapse to eigenstates. And now, we, we don't really have a corollary for this in our terminology in our system. We might say mutating destructive, uh, mutating lazy compute, we might say that, but you know, then we would say a whole sentence to say that was before or after the mutation. Eigenstate eigenvalue is the before or after the mutation, that's all it is. And so, is surprisingly important because our computational density is going up. So wave function collapse. A wave function, when we collapse it, we have all these operands. We're going to do a matrix math function, for example, and we'll solve it. We'll get a value, but we'll discard all the operands. So it'll be a lossy transform. That's our essence of measurement. That's how we measure stuff. How do you measure stuff? You look at them. You look at them and they, they freeze into whatever they're going to freeze into. That's the quantum data structure. That's, that's the reality of the quantum hardware. But in a classical system, that's also how it's going to play out. You do whatever you want, you superposition whatever you want. But when you look at it, when you observe it, when you measure it, it freezes. It's pinned. It's now locked to an eigenstate. Now, the wave function, the wave function is going to be a way to describe through an algorithm. Uh, you can use matrix math if you want, but you don't have to. You're going to describe somehow there's a combination, this complex combination of all these eigenstates. And when I look at it, when I freeze it, when I pin it, it's going to drop to an eigenstate from the superposition possibility set. So reducing to a single set, reducing to a single eigenstate, that's how we measure it. So the dot get is destructed. This is the same code you just looked at a second ago. That's the mutation. B is assigned, and then the line below it is when we decode here. We drop our complex number. So the wave function collapse. It's an irreversible transform. 
just like you know the standard pattern of lazy destructive reading. So this is a really the small excerpt from a really nice um, graphical novel with nonlinear storytelling fashion, describing quantum computing between mom and son. But when you make a measurement, interference is how these values are combined in this quantum particle superposition thing, and the amplitudes interfere with each other. We collapse to a, a unique result, and this is a generalization of probability, but it's not exactly classical probability because we're using complex numbers, imaginary numbers. And so what's actually going to happen if you're working on quantum hardware is you want to choreograph an algorithm and a set of data structures to where they're somehow set up and entangled to where the right answer is in phase and increased amplitude when you destructively interfere so that when you measure it, it probably lands on the right value. And the wrong answers will either be out of phase or um, uh, push, uh, push to a lower probability. So it's going to be an activity of designing data structures to route the interference collapse. Interference collapse. All of quantum computing is I couple and interfere and then I observe. I couple and interfere and then I observe. And you're not running all the answers in parallel. The setup is where you're applying these probability amplitudes into an expression so that when you solve the equation, when you do the matrix solve, you get a result. You're not running them in parallel. Not that I can, I'm a quantum classical simulator of a quantum computer, but you're not really running all the answers in parallel, and that's, that was the shouted answer in this excerpt from that cartoon, which I'm going to go read. It's very well done. So reading a value. So when you read a, a radix 2, what would you expect it to have? So if I have a bunch of radix 2s and like 32 of them, and I pretend they're an integer, what are the real number of states that I might have? Yeah, it's 2 to the 30 second. Yeah, that's it. But now we're going to do something totally different, and we're going to use quantum bits. Now we're going to read the value. And the value I read, how many values might I possibly read? It's the same. It's radix 2. It's not going to give you magical anything new. It's still radix 2. So they're both binary. Now you, you can pick a different base. You can go radix 3, radix 10, go radix whatever you want. But most of the hardware is still sitting on binary. I, I, think, I think we ought to go off of radix 2, but that's another day. This is what's different. When you have your 32-bit integer in memory, it's going to have a discrete resolve bit pattern on a classical machine. That's on the left. But on the, on the other side, if you were to have a quantum version of that, it's only got 32 bits also, but they're superposition. Each bit is in a complex linear combination of a zero state and a one state. So when I actually pin this down, when I drop this eigenvalue to an eigenstate, I will get exactly one, but until that time, I can actually represent all of them. And that's why we get to this interesting observation that the memory requirements are just fundamentally different. So in a classical world, to represent every unique possible value, I need 43 gig to get a 32-bit integer. But in a quantum system, I only need one integer, one 32-bit qubit integer, and now I have the equivalent of 43 gig. This is memory requirements because in that one object, I can superposition it with interesting quantum interference to represent all the values that I find interesting. So quantum supremacy is the idea that, well, a quantum computer is better and it outperforms the classical computer. And you know, there's a lot of arm waving and discussion about that. We're discovering new algorithms, new way to build hardware, new way to do things. But ultimately, you're kind of coming down to the point where at some point, because they're very different and memory requirements are different and algorithms are different, it's a specialized set of problems, but, but how many bits do I really need to really kick butt over the classical computer? At about 50 bits. That's what Google said. About 50 bits. At about 50 bits, you're looking at nine petabytes for every possible value on a classical machine versus, which, which how many of you have nine petabytes on your laptop? <laughs> Any server at home with nine petabytes. Servers do exist with nine petabytes, but most of us don't have them. But if you had just a one qubit, 50 qubit number quantum computer, it would be like this big, it fits in your pocket. Then you could outcompete your classical nine petabit or petabyte machine. 
So that, that's kind of the idea, but there's a, there's a strong assumption. If I were to read that value, I'm only getting, you know, 2 to the 50. So your answer had better fit in there. And if, since your answer is 42, it probably does. But um, y it's not going to be a word processor document that comes, comes out of it. It's a 50-bit number. That's it. So scale is really very different because memory requirements are very different. And we have to come up with a way to structure our data structure and then do an algorithm to get the interference the way we want so that when we observe it, we have a high confidence that we observe the correct value. So that's kind of where we're going with quantum supremacy, but basically specialized problems may adapt well to quantum computing. But you know, we're going back to the classical world. There is a limit. I mean, there's a point at which your classical system is just unworkable. How big can your binary executable get? How big can your data set get? At some point, there is an insurmountable limit to where I can't even load that stuff in memory and still be alive by the time I get, you know, get my answer. So the von Neumann architecture, quantum is kind of flirting with bypassing that. So um, retired instruction count kind of doesn't really matter much on a quantum computer because they, they, they compute stuff in a different way. Yes? So you said a couple times that we only are likely to get the right answers. Does that mean this, that we only really applicable to problems where you can verify the answer after the fact easily? Or? That's a great observation, yes. So, well, yes and no. <laughs> so the yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, so the observation, which is a really good observation, is because this is a generalization of probability, because it's not discrete, because there is some possible error introduced, and a lot of times it's hard to verify that error, um, can you really trust the answers? Well, some things like factoring big numbers, those are easy to test. So you would get the heavy lifting by the quantum computer, and then you can verify. Verify is cheap. So in that example, factoring large integers, which you know there's state actors that like to do that kind of thing, um, that would be easy to trust the quantum answer because you can verify so easily. Many other applications of quantum computers, and most of the stuff they talk about in the news, hard to verify. So uh, you know, complex chemical interactions. Uh, I mean, sometimes if it says, if you build your fab plant this way, you get higher yield. Maybe you can verify it after you spent a few billion dollars. But, uh, and then maybe the same thing for drug discovery. But a lot of it, no, no, take it with a grain of salt. You're really gonna have to start trusting what this system's yielding. So we come up with techniques to basically yield values that we're increasingly confident are probably okay. But um, it is a very serious concern that classical will give you discrete and repeatable in a lot of cases. I mean, there's still stochastic components you can do in classical, but quantum's largely not going to give you that. There's an element of trust here. Generally, we do it through um, repeatability and history, and confidence goes up over time. So classical is not going away, not for a long time. And the first quantum computers are probably going to be based largely on, it's like math coprocessors. We used to have, um, we would offload the math off the CPU chip, and later on we integrated it in. We'll probably have a quantum coprocessor and you'll offload some stuff to that. And, you know, I you still be reluctant to, a lot of red up here. Quantum issues, a lot of red. The hardware is really hard to do. And they're dealing with to tolerances and phenomena that we still really do not understand. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a tricky science. Software has got way higher computational density. And so that's why when you start fiddling with the software on this, it's also, it's, a, it's actually very close to circuit design. You know, that will be in the summary. But your, your software, you can't inspect the value. You can't do runtime classification of data objects. You know, your debugger experience is going to be quite different. So that, that makes this really kind of hard to do. And this, this non-observable state is just something we have to get comfortable with. And then you are going to yield an answer that you may or may not want to trust. And there are techniques to deal with that. But that's all still very young. But it is higher computational density at the cost of significantly higher complexity. And this observer effect is, is pretty phenomenal. Um, that's another talk, really. Okay, quantum. It's multidimensional, so uh, quantum computing, really what you're doing is you're offloading your processing to another dimension. That dimension exists. Those, that discrete interaction of energy interaction with the atomic structure, it's there and it works, but you know, it's a lot of stuff that we don't really observe well. It's not going to be infinitely fast because you still have to sequence, I'm setting up, I'm entangling, I'm observing. You know, this, this, this life breath of setting up your data structures and doing computation, wave function collapse, that's still got to happen. 
So you, you got to build like uh, an ISA or some kind of instruction set architecture to interface with your quantum CPU. You got an error correction that takes time. You might want to, oh, it's a generalization probability. Better run that again. Better run that again. Better run that a billion times and see what the dis distribution is in our sensitivity analysis before we're confident that this answer seems to be okay. So uh, there's, a, there's a whole world of sensitivity analysis that might be significant, especially based on what your problem is. And then quantum data structures, they're really just lazy compute. Now, if you have quantum hardware, you're pushing it into another dimension. If you're doing quantum data structures in a classical machine, it's a lazy compute. So if you like lazy compute, like Haskell, then, you know, this is your thing. Time. So it was said, especially in the beginning, because, you know, Planck, he was very despondent. He was very upset that he had to throw Planck's constant in there. Didn't believe it at all. And then nobody else did either. It took him a long time to accept it. Nobody, you know, a lot of people, especially in the early days, why Schrodinger's still sad, that, you know, I'm sorry, I had anything to do with this whole mess. And, and part of it, a lot of it, was based on this, this crazy unknowns. And that's kind of reminiscent of this quote here, you know, atomic model person guy here. Everything's made up, blah, 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 blah. If quantum mechanics has not profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. Now, they were upset originally about this generalization of probability and this drift into imaginary numbers. That caused a lot of problems because you know, God's throwing dice with the universe. That makes everyone nervous. Uh, but there was one more thing that people did not like, and that was this. Time does not exist. Sure looks like it exists. You are here, you're still here, but time does not exist. Timeline discontinuities exist. Timeline continuities exist. But basically, time is imaginary. Imaginary in the mathematical sense. That Time being a technology, because it is, we can manipulate it and bypass it. It's very interesting, but it made a lot of people very nervous. Feynman played around with this a lot. Time is a technology. It's imaginary in the mathematical sense. Complex numbers, square root of negative one. Time is a technology by which we serialize correlation of effects. Oh wait, you know what? What's multi-threaded programming? Well, it's a technology by which we serialize correlation of effects. So you want to share state? You want to do concurrency? You want to offload across cores and sockets? We got this down. I mean, this is pretty well-trod ground for software, especially since 2004, where most of the core goes everywhere. But if time's a technology, what's implied? Well, all technologies, all technologies, you can bypass them, and you can manipulate them. And we can do that with time. And we, we kind of know this is true, because you know, we're all familiar with general and special relativity. And you know, there's a whole bunch of books and stuff where people chat up in the bar about how things work. But the quantum universe is dropping to these discrete, discrete quantized values whether or not you believe it's there. Our perception is actually what changes. So we're, we're part of this observer effect thing. So it's interesting, but this, is, this made a lot of people nervous. Using it though, we're software. We can use whatever we want. Our world is imaginary. Only it turns out our world is not imaginary, it's quantum. All things have a beginning, middle, and end. It looks a lot like the object model. Constructor, destructor, there's a lifespan, you know, there's a source sink of your objects. This, this is how we build our systems, especially our multi-threaded concurrent systems. Time is a technology for sequencing. And we'll, we'll, what do you want to sequence? Well, we want to sequence across clocks, across threads, life cycles, critical sections. We sequence stuff all the, this is how we get well-defined behavior. So we're pretty familiar with this. We use this a lot. The C++ language happens to be especially good at this because it has such a strong view of the object model, constructor to destructor, source to sync. And so it happens to be a really good mechanism for modeling time. So the quantum life cycle, set up, tear down, you know, it's kind of how everything works, but modeling that, sequencing that, that's what's tricky. So we, we use time as a technology, we're familiar with this. Process A, starts, ends. Ideally, it would look like that. And, and we have a vision of, it, it went from kind of here to there, how long would that take, we kind of know. Well, there's some setup in the beginning, some tear down at the end, there's some overhead around the edges. And you know, I might have to you know, block on some system resource, I'm blocked for some read access to something that somebody else is using. So there are these little bubbles that we insert into our process space, and so now we start getting other clocks. So we've got the user clock, and we've got the system clock, and it doesn't stop there. We now have to context swap on and off of our core, our, our hardware thread, and 
you know, we're, we're interacting with other processes perhaps, but the duration, the duration of the run is not absolute. It's going to vary. It's going to vary all the time. This is, this is why micro benchmarking is so blooming hard. How do you normalize and control for this? Well, it doesn't stop there. Our CPU is throttling its own clock. And you have all these other funny little bubbles and stuff based on context and stack. And so your process is getting messed with quite a lot. And as it turns out, the wall clock can be less than the CPU clock because you might run things in parallel inside your process. So now we have all these clocks. And we're familiar with these clocks. And all the multi-threaded people live in this world. And this is well-trod ground. This is decades old. Absolute measure. Well, you can reset your epic your base time, your, your, your time on your computer. So there's no absolute measure. You can forward or backward your base time, run your process, and it's going to run within the epoch that you've established. Well, you could suspend or hibernate your process, or you could just reset the epoch while your process is running. So we're, we're time shifting this absolute reference. There is no absolute reference. That's the whole point here. Well, if you run multiple processes and they don't share a base epoch, then they have no shared context. And that's relativity, of course. But this epic base time being not absolute, of course it's not absolute. We can do Groundhog Day. We can set up any epic we want. So duration is not fixed. Base time is not fixed. We are very comfortable with this. This is how our processes work. This is also how the quantum universe works. So you can have a lot of games playing with time. But a good metaphor happens to be the time sequence, you know, the movie. Well, the movie, it exists. There's the beginning, a plot, and an end. But you're serially inspecting it. But you don't have to go serial. You can go random access. And that's interesting because this navigation of this sequence is based on the observer effect. I invoke the observer effect maybe 60 times a second for 60 frames a second. And you're going to have a, a sequence. Now, now, most of the time, probably all of us get the same movie ending for the same movie that we rented. But time's a technology. We can pretend it's static, but random access, fiddling with the clock, fiddling with the epic time, that's totally doable. This is a projector. Looks a lot like a Turing machine because there's time. Technology manipulating time. This is a really neat one. Go check out this video. It's a hunk of 3D printed plastic. And when you spin it, you get this animated sequence, and it's so cool. But that is time as an illusion. It, time isn't real, you're, you're perceiving it as an illusion. So, pardon? I was thinking of that as your eyes have a frame rate. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, so your eyes have a frame rate? Yes, quite literally, not kidding for real, from a physics standpoint, your eyes are invoking the observer effect at a rate and you are collapsing probabilities all around you. Now, at the macro scale, there are a lot of photons hitting these chairs. So they, they generally don't malform and do weird quantum things when we're not looking, because so many other things are looking, because detectors work too. But at the small scale, lots of things can hide. So a mathematical basis does really exist, for real, not kidding, supported by physics observations, that actions in the future can be wave function correlated with things in the past which means Star Trek or all these sci-fi movies where effect precedes cause. And two hours later, they figure that out in your, in your movie or your episode or whatever it is. So this um, mass not being absolute, that's true. Time not being absolute, well, that's true. Makes people nervous, especially 120 years ago. But offer waves come forward because it's a waveform. It's a standing waveform. You are entangled with your future self. It's surprising. It's weird. It doesn't sound right. But that's physics, what it happens to be. But that's not our talk today. We're talking about software and data structures. So there it is. The quantum data structure. What does it look like? When I say nature, I'm saying the observed and mathematically predicted reality as described by quantum physics, which has been correct thus far, where Newtonian falls down quite a lot. An object does behave differently when it is not being observed. When it's not being observed, it is not yet measured. It is not yet pinned to an eigenstate. It's in an eigenvalue. And in that eigenvalue, it behaves differently, because once it's pinned, it's pinned. So a quantum object exists with a portion of its life cycle that is not measured, not observed. You did not yet wave function collapse it. That's true for quantum. It's also 
true for you know the natural world, but for quantum data structures, that's ultimately what we're talking about. So attributes. This is your quantum data structure. It's going to have state. It's going to transition to quantum jumps. These are transactionally atomic mutations from one value to another value without a transport through intermediate values. You cannot inspect the intermediate state by observing it. You're triggering a wave function collapse. It's a destructive read. Sorry. It does undermine type safety because you can couple any data types you want to any other data types. But I think, I'd only like to couple this with that. No, no, you know, you're going to want a couple bools to date. You want a couple date to the chair in the room. You're going to want to couple all kinds of types, uh, but, you know, the quantum universe couples everything anyway. So whether you want to or not, um, type safety is going to be undermined to be useful. And high coupling and high complexity is the name of the game. So quantum data structures, they're not for the faint of heart, because type punning is kind of expected, kind of like floating compare, comparing of float objects, it's hard because you're playing with games with the quantum cross ranges. You're gonna be doing that with all your data objects. That's, that's kind of scary. And of course, memory requirements are different. So, oh, go down. So using it though, you know, your API, if you were to use these quantum data objects, you're gonna to wanna to do transactional atomic mutation of the object. And you're probably gonna to wanna to know um, did I collapse this thing yet or not? Is it an eigenvalue or an eigenstate? Because it's irreversible once you, once you observe it. And then it's pinned and then you're safe. So it's helpful to be able to distinguish between those things. But basically, this is life cycle stuff. You have a source to a sink. And you're, you're basically going to have to be disciplined about I create, I entangle, I observe, I collapse. And that's going to be the life cycle. Now, that's nothing new. I mean, this is classical software that you want to have a source sync. We have producer-consumer models. We especially do this for distributed computing or high-performance computing. This is all just old hat for us, but that life cycle is really important. You will have probably stateless functional algorithms. Matrix math, it's complicated, but it's a stateless functional thing. You give a bunch of operands, it yields a value. There's a destructive discarding of, of operands and yielding that value. But you can still code your stateless functional things, but your state, your mutating state, you'll have to plan access to that. It's usable, but once you observe it, no going back. These patterns are nothing new. So if you're already doing lazy compute, or factory, or future promise, or pimple, or dynamic CTOR, or whatever language you want to do, lots of patterns that we have that's accepted as good and well-defined practice totally adapt straight into quantum data structures, quantum compute, because, you know, source sync. You just have to plan out your access because it's mutating destructive read. There might be some new patterns. So, you know, here's, a, here's kind of a shot, some new patterns. So this functional quantum where, you know, I'll entangle with the system clock and it'll keep yielding me values, but it remains entangled with some stochastic input there, still generating, you know, random numbers or system clock progression or whatever it is. You know, that, that's kind of like a, a functionally quantum thing or the st sticky quantum where, you know, maybe I'll observe the sprite every time the frame update is there, but I still want it to be coupled to the logic that's animating the sprite. But, you know, that's basically double buffering. It, it's basically triple buffering, you know, depending on how far you want to go. These are not that new. We do these things now. These are not a surprise. So we have long throughout the software industry history decided that we have a lot of state. We have to organize it. We have to somehow couple it in a sensible way. It has to progress. And we have source sync life cycles. We have rules. We do sequencing for distributed computing and our parallel processing. All that stuff is based on the principles of quantum observable. The only difference is um, now we have a generalization of probability. We have complex numbers if you actually want to do the quantum thing. But this is all consistent with existing practice. There's nothing new here. So it's interesting, but there's nothing new. Key observations. A lot of stuff is the same. It's what we do now. If you have a well-defined system, it's going to work it, it, with quantum data structures. Now, there is a difference with the sequencing thing. You know, we, we really do need to manage our sequencing, except when I do an observation, when I do a dot get, that's going to be a mutating destructive access, an irreversible side effect. So any of the sequencing for that is actually going to be internal to the object. It's not in the algorithm. 
It's not in set up critical sections, run some stuff, and drop my fence. You know, we have semaphores and stuff to help organize stuff by writing imperative logic to reason about a lock-free algorithm or something. That's all in the algorithm. That's not true with a quantum data structure. A quantum data structure is doing its own sequencing. It will transition through an atomic transaction to a new value whether you like that or not. It seizes control of its own mutation, its own value. So sequencing is in the data object, not in the algorithm. That's the takeaway today. If you want to do quantum data structures, your sequencing is in the data object, not in the algorithm. The coupling and complexity is, is higher, and that, that's just an attribute of the phenomenon of quantum interference if you're on hardware, or if you're on a classical machine, it's an attribute of we are increasing the computational density of how we structure stuff so that when the wave function collapse, we yield a value, higher complexity, but we yield more powerful values with fewer instructions and fewer um, data requirements. So that's interesting. So down, down. It is similar to what we're doing now. It's kind of nothing new. Uh, our techniques, our practices, our idioms, everything holds true. So quantum computing, cool, we're there. Um, eigenstate eigenvalue might be good to kind of drop those around the water cooler just so you know is this pinned because I, I don't want to look at it if it's pinned I'll look at it but you don't want to look at it until it's pinned so you will need some kind of vernacular to distinguish between those two things and uh, largely we'll have to start getting comfortable with computational density changes in our in our approach but if the artist software is defining rules for quantization because everything drops everything drops to discrete values in this quantum data structure or, or in the observed world, the natural world, the natural universe, the quantum universe. We, okay, we kind of know that. It's kind of how everything works. You know, it, it's kind of already current practice, kind of no big deal. We got this weird thing about sequencing. It's in the object now except the algorithm. But if you have a quantum computer at home, your software will look different. And we're not talking about that today, but let's tell you what's going to be different. If you have quantum hardware, it's kind of like authoring constexpr lock-free algorithms. So if you like constexpr and you like lock-free algorithms, you know, these are tedious and tricky and they're hard to debug and hard to reason about, but you know, they're very clever. So quite many people are, are attracted to them. Well, quantum computing on quantum hardware is for you because it's all like that. It's hard because your sequencing is in the data structure. This is actually circuit design. It's a lot closer to circuit design. So if you do firmware, if you do anything dealing very closely with circuit design, that dependency reference stuff, you set that up before it goes to fabrication. And then it gets stamped out and shipped. And then later on, it runs and it works. Well, software doesn't work like that. Software, typically, well, I want to do my runtime classification. I want to do runtime conditional branching. I want to look at the value and say, what are you? Oh, you're a two. You go this way. And everybody else goes that way. That runtime classification, you, classically you get that. But on quantum hardware, you don't get that. You're doing closer to circuit design. So there will be another talk maybe about that. But um, quantum hardware programming is basically uh, very tedious, very much smaller algorithms because you don't get the freedom of you know, just branching and calling conditional switches whenever you want. So sequencing. Classical sequences by the algorithm, quantum sequences through the data structure. Software, we typically do imperative execution based on runtime classification. Hardware, it does it through the circuit, through the dependency references established in the schematic. That's what went to FAM. So quantum software on quantum hardware actually looks closer to that hardware line. So software and quantum hardware, that's that red block. You can't look at the value. You can't conditionally process based on the value. You can't rely on imperative sequencing because everything's inside that wave function collapse. You can set it up, and then you observe, and it collapses. And it's, it's a generalization of probability. It's non-deterministic. So depending on your problem, you, know, you may have some, some angst at accepting the value that, that is produced. So you can emulate a lot of this stuff in quantum or uh, quantum stuff in classical hardware, classical software, but it can be resource expensive. So quantum sequencing. So if you're into the functional programming thing, and there's a big resurgence in that, um, that's the opposite of quantum. 
So everything in functional programming is based on no side effect. Everything is computed from first principles. In the quantum universe, that doesn't exist. The thought doesn't exist. In the quantum universe, everything is entangled with everything. And when I observe something, it freezes to a discrete value. And by definition, it is side effect. Everything you look at is side effect. In the quantum universe, quite literally, everything you think, see, and do, and observe causes side effect. So you're not going to get functional processing. Now the idea of functional processing, matrix math is a complex functional transform. You know, we can still write algorithms, but they're going to be employed to do many operands in, computer result out, destructive reading. So the quantum data structure really seizes control of its sequencing. And so we are liberating the data structure, that's our higher computational density, the mechanism being quantum interference, and your algorithm is going to kind of lower in importance because everything's going to be inside the data structure. So final thoughts, summing up. This is the real world. It's kind of fringe science because it's very hard to test, but you know, we live in a quantum universe. So there is a solid basis. We already do this quantum thinking, it's already in practice, but um, increased complexity, maybe some changing of some preference for idioms, that might be different a little bit, might do some unfamiliar idioms, you know, get comfortable with employing values that you can't look at. You're using them, but you don't know what they are. You can't runtime classify them, that's somebody else's job to wave function collapse them. So some kind of source sync thing. Uh, you will probably go crazy unless you get comfortable with some precise way of thinking about and terminology application to convey a thought so that other people unambiguously understand the thought. And the land of quantum physics, you know, whiteboard people doing math, they have very precise notation for this. So, you know, they're, they're really very good at that. We'll probably need to, you know, do eigenstate, eigenvalue, maybe some other stuff. But we're going to have to be very consistent about conveying the higher computational density of this quantum data structure, of this quantum system with the life cycle of that data structure. We will have to convey that to other humans so they understand the system. And probably terminology and discipline will be re required for that. But all your sequencing is in the data object. So uh, the, the last one on the bottom, what's your state, what's your entanglement, and what's your create, destroy life cycle, what's your source sync? That's, that's what we do now. It's just that you better really do that. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, the whole world blows up and everyone dies. So software, we are probably the most well-adapted engineers on the planet, bar none, to do this quantum thing. Other engineers, they have a lot of problems and you know, other disciplines, they, you know, some of this, this weird, crazy Nobel Prize physics stuff it's weird, but you know, we know what process, time's not absolute, epics are volatile, you know, you know, relativity, we, we got all that stuff down, we have notation for it. We can, we can actually build executable descriptive systems, that's what our software is. We just describe a world, it's a fictional world, and then we run it. And it turns out, fast forward enough decades, oh, it wasn't fictional at all. You were actually tapping into how the quantum universe works. So every crazy little thing we dream up, uh, turns out that works. So most all our techniques just map straight across. Quantum hardware people, they have it hard. So, you know, Google's screwing around with their superconducting qubit, and Microsoft's got their topological qubit. That's a, that's a risk, but there's some real advantages there. They released Q-sharp, if you want to see the API on that. That came out in December. They kicked it around last year. I almost put a bunch of stuff in there for that, but getting into quantum hardware just takes too much time, so it'll be a different talk. Intel, of course, is playing with nuclei spins, and, you know, D-Wave's doing the quantum annealing. So, Everything, everything is in the quantum universe, and how you want to trigger this wave function collapse to an observed value, it's just a resolution problem, that's all. You know, do you have a clock and a, a detector that's good enough to pick up that quantized value that's being produced in the natural world? If you can, you're good. And so now there's, there's a tremendous amount of noise, so all of these people are isolating the hardware so that they can basically manipulate it to get a value, but you know, when you're clicking clacking on your keyboard, that's at room temperature. There's a lot of noise at room temperature. Somehow that has to go into the computer, come out of the computer, the quantum CPU, and you know, that, that transition is fraught with a lot of volatility, a lot of risk, a lot of error can be introduced. So they have it hard, but that's about it. So it's, 
Yeah, it's cold. <laughs>